Hey, Carly. Hi, Matt. Hey, how are you? I'm excited. It's going to be I'm, fun. I'm super excited, too. Have you heard from Dale? I expected him to be here. I thought he said something about being on the shore with his family. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he was going down the shore with his family, but if he's on vacation, uh, I assume that he would set aside time for us. I'm, let, yeah. let me give him a call, just a second. Carly, Matt, good to see you guys. Hey, Dill, where are you at? Uh, sorry, I was at the Jersey Shore. I fell asleep on the sand. I was sunbathing and, you know, I got drowsy. Okay, are you are you all right? Yeah, time slipped away. But if you guys can riff for me, I'll be back in the studio any minute. All right. Um, Just put some aloe on it. Or holy water. Okay. Oh, and I'm supposed to say one last thing. Live from New York, it's set. Oh. Frame wreck. What a story, Mark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Frame Wreck, our third ever Frame Wreck redemption because uh we like this film matt we like this film carly we like this director and we're excited to talk about m night Shyamalan's old as part of our spooky season festivities uh matt how you doing maddie fresh uh fresh after the ripe old age of 40 looking great um aged only 40 years but aged like a fine wine if i do say so myself how you doing matt uh doing all right uh i'm i'm uh very excited to talk about this movie and and uh yeah, I it's 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 great. It, I mean, the weird thing is, I was twenty just five hours ago, but you know. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's good. Oh, these jokes are never getting old. Uh, Carly, uh, welcome back to the show. Um, the infamous Carly, who uh, whose cats episode is our most viewed fair framework episode ever, um, which is just such an honor because uh, it was so f- cool to get you on for that. And now it's about a year later. We're covering old. Uh, I think this was an idea you pitched to us. Um, mm. How you feeling? Welcome back. Uh, are you excited? Uh, spooky season it seems like it's your time of year as it is all of us but um especially you with that witch's hat i love it um how you doing carly i'm good i'm i'm really excited to talk about m night Shyamalan. i'm excited to be on a redemption too mm, so yeah. that'll it's gonna be very special absolutely i mean we're nothing it, without you carly as he mentioned yeah. we, we we can't get views without you so we're excited yes, for you're, 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 you're a key to um our viewership and our audience no but i i do think you know you pick great films to talk about that have such a polarizing kind of conversation around them cats being you know this huge big blockbuster catastrophe um a few years ago literally catastrophe but now you have like this film which is I think one of the most polarizing M. Night Shyamalan films, I mean, Carly, you said you were excited to talk about Shyamalan. I think it is such a great fit for our show, Matt, because it's like, this is a director where I feel like every single film you could point to, except for maybe his like earliest few, and you're going to have people who love it and people who think it's the worst thing ever. And I think that's just such a fascinating element to his filmography to where I think it really lends itself well to what we're going to be talking about um, and the things we talk about, but especially when we can like forgive them, which is the most fun, you know? And usually everybody is absolutely right when they, no matter which side they're on. <laughs> right? They're, they're like, yep, M. Night Shyamalan clearly doesn't know how to write dialogue, even though he clearly knew how to in Sixth Sense. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe just uh, style is a thing, but now people just don't understand that. Uh, it, it's just so funny, like, hearing the different criticisms of, like, M. Night Shyamalan can't write dialogue, or he can't frame a scene, or he can't, it, it's like, he can. It's just, it's a choice that he decides to do. And, and I think the choice can, you can like it or hate it, but I just think it's really fascinating that, like, some people can definitively say, like, this is an objectively bad film when it's like, no, you just don't like the choices, you know? And I, I think that's what makes it uh, such a fascinating kind of conversation to have. Um, but Carly, why old? Why, why was old the one that you were like, we need to get, I need to get on frame rack and, and talk about old with, with Dylan and Matt. Um, I don't remember exactly what inspired it. Um, I do remember I watched trap and I was not a fan of trap. <sighs> and I was, I think I was just like thinking about his filmography a little bit. Um, Cause I realized I've seen a lot more of it than I thought. I was like, Oh, I've probably seen like five. And I was counting them. I was like, No, I've seen like eight of the films. And like, this is one that I loved coming out of the theater. I was like, this is awesome. And then I heard a lot of people did not love it. And I did not get it at all. Just because 
I'm a big body horror fan, fan and this is so body horror. Um, and I, I just think it, it's such an entertaining watch. Like I can get why people don't love it, but I do love it. And I think it's a really good spooky season watch and, it's just a ton of fun. Yeah, I think that's the most fun thing about like our modern kind of movie going climate as a society is that like you'll have movies where you'll like if you see it the first weekend, you don't really know what the cultural buzz is unless it's like played at festivals or something. So like you'll leave a movie and be like, that was awesome. And then you'll look online and like all these people are trashing it, which is so fascinating because it's not like, you know, some of the shows that Matt and I cover where it's like they've had decades and decades of legacy. It's like when you walk out of a movie that you loved and you find out that everyone else hated, it's a weird kind of feeling. And I think that's why like we are so passionate about the movies that we cover on Framework redemption mac like this and crystal skull like these ideas of like movies that like we left being like that was awesome and now you know we are in the minority which is just such an interesting feeling usually it's it's fun to be on the inverse where you're like you know i, I didn't like this movie and then everyone's like it's a masterpiece and you could kind of be that contrarian but it's kind of weird when you're the one getting ganged up on in, a, in an other sense where everyone's telling you you're wrong for liking it um and i just think that's a very interesting kind of space to be in um and i love that the three of us do like it enough to kind of reappraise it and then give it its due because I, I do agree i think it's one of the best body horror films of the last 10 years i think it's one of the best horror films of the last 10 years i think it's one of his best as well and i chama so so, um, Matt, what was your first experience watching Old Lake? Like, what did well, you see it in the theater? No, I actually watched it for this. I we I was we weren't sure if this was going to be a redemption or not because I hadn't seen it. Ah, okay, cool. And so I, um, I actually just watched it for this for the first time. Let me. Okay, so the trailers for this movie. I just for anybody out there who doesn't know, I have like severe anxiety, uh, mm. and occasionally. I will have them in the movie theater. Movie theater is generally a, 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 a sanctuary for me and a place I can go to kind of feel good. But occasionally, especially during trailers, I can have one of those panic attacks. Every single time the old trailer came on, I would have my I would have a little panic attack. Hmm. Not sure why. I I assume because a lot of my anxiety resolves revolves around uh, death, my death, <laughs> and so. Uh, just that the concept of it just i guess freaked me out i don't know there wasn't a certain thing i was thinking about just like i'd have my my uh my panic attack during well it's also it's also worth noting this came out in 2021 it was filmed in 2020 we were still kind of coming out mm -hmm. of the pandemic like this was only a few months after theaters had like fully reopened so i think there's yeah. also that anxiety you know the film actually plays with the idea of time slipping away and you not being able to recognize it until it's too late especially right. in re in regards to illness and just to this kind of like idea that everyone's dying slowly but surely it is a weird movie to watch with that mentality and i think everyone's mm -hmm. kind of lens on the pandemic kind of heightened everyone's kind of opinions on this especially mm -hmm. in that regard the people who loved it because they could kind of sense that kind of pandemic paranoia kind of slipping in as well on top of our own kind of individual illnesses or, or grievances or, or little things you know or little ticks you know it was all, all emphasized by the fact that we were all kind of going through this kind of all encompassing cultural mindset of like oh time is slipping away from us we've spent a whole year sitting around fearing that we may be the next to go like that's crazy right. to me like and i think that's why i do appreciate this film so much at the time and now especially in retrospect we're understanding that this kind of also kind of embodies the kind of cultural mindset of the time, which I think is fascinating. Uh, the other trailer that used to give me a panic attack every time, and I can't explain this one, was House of Gucci. Uh, <laughs> I didn't watch that until it was out on video because of, because like every time I was like, I don't know that I can do this. Maybe the whole thing is going to kill me. Uh, and then I'd watch, when I finally watched it, I was like, there's nothing here. I don't know. I have no idea why I got a panic attack every single time that trailer came on, but at least old I can explain. House of Gucci, I have no idea. Maybe it was yeah. uh maybe it was Jared Leto. Yeah, and I mean old old <laughs> that's funny. Uh old is also a horror film, so it's like it, it's yeah. supposed to invoke some sort of fear in you, which combined with the idea that this movie's fear is fear of death, it's it, it is a lot. It is a lot, yeah. and I can see why people didn't like it. But it's interesting to see the reasons people didn't like it is not that it hit too close to home or that it made them uncomfortable or uneasy. It was like all these like really fundamental specific things that I feel like at this point you know, so far down the line in his career, you can kind of expect from M. Night Shyamalan. I think that's kind of, I was reading Carly, your letterbox review of this film. And it was kind of like, you know what? It's the, the dialogue is, is a problem, but it's, 
always a problem like that's his style like that's kind of just mm-hmm. how he writes and and I, th- I think it was so funny to like hear people's criticisms be something that has been criticized for movies and movies and movies i think it's just now when you're returning back to the horror blanket itself it's like there's an expectation because everyone's expecting the next six cents or signs because that was a very widely acclaimed batch of films that he made in the horror genre so it's like oh he's come back to horror the visit was good the village was good all right he's gonna deliver and it's like no um and people didn't think so it's to me that's like that's like people complaining about uh, about bad acting and shoddy writing in Star Wars. Mm. At this point, those are staples for the franchise. Right. I don't I don't understand why that's ever a conversation anymore. If right. if you're upset mm-hmm. about bad writing in Star Wars, uh, did you ever watch any Star Wars? Mm-hmm. Is my question. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, and for like this film specifically, the writing and even the way it's shot, like you got to look at like okay, it might not be pleasing but does it make sense with the story you're telling? And I know exactly. Carly brought up that you didn't love Trap, but like one of the reasons I love Trap is because he found a character that kind of was this person trying to blend in with the normalcy of humanity, even though he's a raging serial killer or psychopath. And like, how does that affect the way he communicates with others? And it actually led to a cool vessel. And I think this is kind of a similar deal where you're dealing with kids who are aging into adults very rapidly. Like, how do you kind of create a language and a way of speaking that makes it feel somewhat uncanny. And I think it works in, in that respect, you know? Um, So I think the dialogue, first and foremost, we could all agree, like it is intentional. It's not supposed to be good, but it's intentionally bad for a purpose for the characters and for the stories he's telling. I think Um, I assume you all agree. Um, I'd like to hear from Carly on that. Yeah. I was about to say like, yeah, yeah. yeah, Carly. Yeah. And well, the dialogue's not something I really gave much thought. I just, you know, it's M. Night Shyamalan. He, he writes his dialogue weird. And that's just something that I kind of, you know, it's it's just fun. Like, it's fun having the stilted dialogue and the weird phrases and all that. It's just, so, it's just something I kind of take as like part of the ride of an M. Night Shyamalan film. So. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and it's funny when people choose to, choose to uh, insert their dislike for, for specific styles of writing or or direction or anything like that, no one gets mad at Yorgos Lanthimos for his stilted writing and 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 st- like I don't want to call the acting stale, but it is very rigid. The re- the acting he requests from his actors is very rigid, as is his dialogue. No one gets mad at that. Everybody loves that. Mm. Uh, but in Night Shyamalan, who has a very similar, although not as good. Uh, in, in the writing and acting uh, uh, in his department, it's not as good, but it it is very, it is very. Uh, oh, there's a child. Go on. Uh, and it is, it is. Hold on, bud. Sorry. Uh, it is, it is, um, it is very. Uh, uh, it is, it is very similar in style. Is what I'm saying. Carly, what else like appealed to you about these? You, you talked about the body horror. We could talk about it now because I do think this is one of the strongest elements of this film. The idea that like, you know, these people are aging rapidly, but also they are still trying to move like their younger selves. And because of that, you get like, you know, bones snapping in half or people like losing their vision, losing their hearing and what that aids in the visual language of the characters and and the body horror. Like, I want to hear you speak on that because I I also love body horror. I'm a big fan of body horror, especially when it feels so raw and real, like you can like anything that involves like bone snapping and shit like that that's stuff mm-hmm. that you can like physically relate to because you know what it's like to hit your elbow against something and, and hit your funny bone you know you know that visceral feeling that you know you you don't know necessarily and no one's shared a lot of paranormal ex- experiences or no one's really seen a zombie but like people know what it's like to like hurt a bone or break a bone or like mm-hmm. get a scab or, or get a cut you know like i think that's what body horror why it works so well even obviously it's you know heightened um but uh, but talk about the body horror for a little bit because because i, I want to hear from you the one that sticks out most to me is the tumor removing scene in mm-hmm. which they have to put their hands inside her, her wound to like keep it open so they can pull a cantaloupe sized tumor out yeah. and like like it's that thing where I'm like cringing and looking away while I'm watching it, but also loving it because it's so grotesque and mm-hmm. like horrific and like how you see the tumor like getting bigger and bigger before they like have to hold like like I just love how there's so many horrific elements to the aging that aren't even like it's not necessarily bad that her wound would heal immediately, but then they show you like the worst version of that where it's like oh, we have to hold it open in right. order to get this out and keep her from dying. And it's just, 
so like that that one just sticks out in my head more than anything like like that alone makes me love this movie just because it's so it's so extreme and so out there like it's part of why i love the substance because it's so the body horror is just like next level and it's so gnarly and like it's exactly why some people don't love those type of movies but it's exactly why i do love them so yeah absolutely matt any thoughts on the body horror i I have a love-hate relationship with body horror um some movies i really really love are have really great body horror uh but if i don't love the movie then the body horror is something i can't really take like the body horror is a problem for me the substance one of my favorite movies of the year i i absolutely love that movie the body horror is amazing the fly amazing um this one uh, i didn't the body horror wasn't that bad luckily i liked it anyway but the tumor scene was interesting the thing that the thing about that scene um that because I watched this twice, as I always do. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, when I was watching the second time, I realized something, because I d- it didn't think about the context the first time, because I didn't know it was going to happen. But a big climactic moment is when she stabs the guy with a rusty knife, and he immediately gets all infected and, 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 uh, and dies from the sudden rusty knife in his body. A bunch of people who have not washed their hands put their hands in this woman's body. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish there had been a... A moment where they had been, where they had found a way to disinfect quickly, like <laughs> just been like everybody go into the ocean and wash off your hands or something, uh, so that we could avoid that. However, um, the uh, it was very, it was that that uh, the tumor scene was because uh, I was expecting smaller tumor, and then it's like he's like it's a cantaloupe. And then when he pulls it out, it's even bigger than a kennel. Like it's right because it grows as, as they're trying to get it, as, out. as they're yeah. trying to get yeah. it, which is awesome. Um, I really liked uh, the way that they that scene was constructed. It, 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 uh, it you could feel the tension of what was happening uh, in it. Um, I will say, as far as the body horror in this movie, I thought they could have shown more uh, because there were certain things where where uh, I kind of he kind of cuts away mm-hmm. right as the right as the thing's about to happen when the girl falls from the thing and then we never see her body. The um, decomposed body, we only see like through the through its ribs. We don't actually ever see it, which I think is an interesting choice because I think that they're trying, like I think that he's, because um, he's focusing on his characters, not necessarily the horror imagery in, in those things. So I, I definitely get that. And you would have to like, not seeing the bones makes it feel much more real than if we saw the bones and it didn't look yeah. real. Like, oh my gosh, I, I love, fun. yeah, I love the bones, um, especially with the baby, the way like when he finally is like, we, we got to bury and he picks up and you just like hear the and clanging, hear, and clanging of the bones. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually really like the the choices to not necessarily show all the horror because I do think a lot of it is based on the other perspective of the other characters because they're the ones who live. They're the ones who have to take it on. And I think, especially looking at it, like I said, in like a COVID lens, it's like, you know, there were there were a lot of families that, you know, your, your loved ones went to the hospital and they never came back but because it was covid you couldn't have funerals for them you couldn't literally see them again and i think Mm -hmm. there's like something to be said about that too the idea of like oh when they're gone they're gone and because this is moving so fast life is moving so fast you don't have that closure and i think they're giving the audience that sense of it too and my chamon's basically saying no you're not getting the closure either because this is the point we're trying to make we're trying to make it go fast and i know yeah it is unsatisfying in that way but also after seeing Midsommar, I don't necessarily know if I want to see what what she looks like after falling off the cliff. You know what I mean? Something I like that. that yeah. To where I'm like, I, I think I'm I'm okay. I'm content with like what we saw versus didn't see because what we do see is still there's still an extent to it. Like the tumor, the, the scar growing yeah. back is cool, but like just cutting it open is gross. Like the whole um, I, I call her the I I used to call her the swastika, but it seemed a little inappropriate, so I call her the pretzel. You know, when the one oh. woman is like kind of like con, you know she's contorted and her bones are like kind of shifting at different angles and stuff. That to me is always the one that gets me is scared the most because also it kind of like goes black and then like kind of comes up again like the lighting of that scene is really terrifying um and it honestly feels very apropos now having seen the substance this idea of like you know she's the one who's trying to cling on to her beauty and, and that's what i like about this film too is like every single character feels like it's commentating on a different type of aging you know the idea of you know um uh, her being like this beautiful woman who wants to preserve her beauty. And then you have the kids who's like, you know, they're moving too fast and you want to preserve their youth because they're innocent. You want to preserve their innocence. You don't want them to grow up too fast. Like I like how each character kind of has a different thing that kind of, you know, with aging affects their overall character arcs, which I think is, is really fascinating. But the, the human pretzel is, is the one that always gets me most unnerved. Um, and, and just, and also, the- she's a, 
She's yeah, a very, very white lady, and her husband's racist, so I think swastika's fine. Yeah, so there you go. Um, but it, more so just the imagery, but yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, but yeah, like, I, I even like how the, how that plays into it, too. You know, the whole, like, as you grow older, your biases come through. You, you're a little less restrained, like, in his sense, too. He, like, is a little bit more of a loose cannon, loose filter, as we see with our America nowadays. When you're older, you feel like you can be more outspoken. Like, I, I really like how each character kind of takes on a different idea and concept of aging with this overall premise of time is moving so fast and you either have to like just accept that we're all gonna die someday and we have to make the best of it like i love when the two build a sandcastle together that's so Mm -hmm. touching because it's like you know they're they're losing years of their life but they want to do this thing together because they they feel like it'll make them happy in that moment whereas the characters who feel, feel like they can cheat it feel like they can beat it feel like they can be the hero even though they have to just kind of accept what the circumstance is and i think that was just so much of what covid was it's like the people are like well i'm not gonna wear a mask like i'm gonna go out i I, we're gonna beat this or the people who are like well i'm gonna sit inside and and i might be wasting time but i'll be doing it with people i love and and trying to make the best of it and 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 be safe and just enjoy the time i do have if this ends up being the end of the world and i think that's Mm -hmm. a really cool kind of kind of notion as as well but um Uh, you mentioned the sandcastle uh this uh this is actually based on a a uh I want to say a graphic novel, but it graphic might be novel, a yeah. novel. It's a graphic mm-hmm. novel called Sandcastle uh, mm-hmm. by Frederick Peters. Mm-hmm. Um, the them building the sandcastle actually gave me the most anxiety in the whole movie because I was like, "You're running out of time, man! Come on!" Yeah. Like, but I do agree with you. I think it's beautiful that they they took that moment. Like, if this is our last, let's let's spend it doing this thing. Like, I, I really I really enjoyed that as well. Yeah, I, I just think there's so many great ideas that you can make from this ger- general premise because the general premise is very basic, but also very genius where you can kind of fill it in with with so many different things. Um, yeah, I, I would like to talk about the pregnancy part because yeah, of course, yeah, that that because pregnancy has always been a little bit body horror to me, um, just because it's this thing entering your body and kind of, and like seeing that sped up over like like her being pregnant like. I can't remember how long it takes, but like she was five minutes pregnant or five months pregnant in like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. And just, just the idea of her body, like rapidly changing. And then suddenly it's like, Oh, this baby's coming. Like nine months is a short enough time to get ready for a new child. But like Mm. within like 20, 30 minutes of her just giving birth to this baby. um, And then it immediately dying because they don't hold it for like, five seconds or something it it was just like so horrific and um it was like i thought it was like really well done like so just the most horrific part of the movie to me is that because and like these just these kids growing up so quickly being like oh we did it one time and now now she's pregnant and then it's the a great commentary on contraception yeah. as well you know they oh, yeah. we're, we're, you know these kids are, are they're kids you know they they are grown up but they're kids still and they don't know better and and then it leads to something that can be life changing in a way mm-hmm. um, right yeah. uh, it's it's a good commentary on sex education uh, <laughs> yeah, I live I I live in Oklahoma. Uh, where abstinence-only education is allowed in schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they don't have to teach sex education. Um, and that's why we have one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the country. Um, but uh, the um, that, that, that scene that where he's, uh, where he's like, what, where they're like, what did you do? He's like, we only did it once. It's like, and he said, he said, you have to like do it like 10 times to get pregnant. I was like, no, buddy. It can happen with just once. Like yeah. somebody has to tell him that he's like, "Oh no," um, <laughs> but uh, uh, that uh, that that is actually an excellent commentary on 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 education and and how you have to kind of you you know their their bodies are growing faster than their minds, which is true about uh, kid teenagers too. Yeah. Like their body is doing is ready for things that their brains aren't ready for, or Absolutely. at least aren't aren't uh need to need to be educated on because their bodies are ready for Mm -hmm. it um yeah yeah. 
and it's uncomfortable in the way they cast these actors as those roles too because like uh we, we were even talking about off air like the idea that thomas and mckenzie someone that like we grown up watching as like or not grown up but like the, in the past few decades like we've seen as a child actor same as alex wolf it's like these people that we saw as kids like i watched alex wolf in the naked brothers band on nickelodeon now he's like a full-grown man i think it's also a commentary of that too it's like where did the time go i mean now they're like fully grown like they're wearing swim like tight-fitting swimsuits and, it, and it's uncomfortable to the audience because it's like they grew up so fast it's kind of like when i when i saw that jacob tremblay just graduated college or something i'm like what i was like or, or high school and i'm like the, the little kid from room it, it's like that idea too of like you know life goes so fast and, and if you if you don't pay attention if you don't try kind of cherish it it'll slip away uh, essentially or or just you know you won't have that because you can't go back um which i think is ferris bueller told us that yeah uh, right yeah he would love this movie he would love this movie um you know he, he probably likes the beach yeah um, like there's yeah. this one quote i think they say in there where they're talking about how i wonder if everybody continues to feel like a kid when they're our age or is it just because we were kids yesterday and it's like that's such a deep quote because it's like you know when you're aging you don't you know when you're 18 you don't feel 18 when you're 30 you don't feel 30 it just like your brain doesn't always sync up with this arbitrary age you are so I thought that was really an interesting point to make. I agree. As a man of 40, uh, <laughs> let me tell you that I uh, sometimes think about like, I thought I wouldn't want this anymore at this age. I thought I wouldn't be interested in this kind of thing at this age. Like there's certain things where I'm like, it's interesting to me because I had this idea of what being an adult is. And, uh, and, and I am a lot of that is, I mean, I, I, married i have kids i i uh, have a good life but sometimes i'm just like sometimes i think about like there are things that i loved or cared about as a kid that i still care about today that i didn't think i'd still care about so i do like that that aspect of it as well do because it is a it's a question that i don't have the answer to that that kid asked <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like was it just because he was a kid yesterday or is this how everyone is i know that's how i am sometimes so. Right. Um, cool. Uh, so we've talked about the, like the themes of aging. We've talked about the body horror. We've talked about a little bit about the dialogue. I, I do want to kind of touch on something that we were a little bit talking about, which is like the style and the way it's shot. And, and, you know, we talked about like what is like not shown versus shown, but I also think just the way this film uses close ups is, is really interesting. Um, the idea that these characters are not only aging, but they're getting too big for the frame itself to where you'll get like shots where it's just a shoulder or just like the corner of someone's face or just someone's eye as a device to show that I, I think is really, really fascinating. I've seen a lot of people just really, um, shit on this film for the cinematography but i i actually think it's one of the the biggest assets of this film also because it kind of moves along like a pendulum kind of showing this time swinging back and forth in the way it kind of very quickly jumps from one to the next there's like great dolly zooms in this thing split dived or shots like i just think there's so many really cool techniques just in the camera work to also give you this kind of dizzying manic effect because when you only have one setting you have to still try to keep it engaging you can't just have them sitting on a beach otherwise it just becomes a play at that point you need to try to find ways to make it more engaging with the camera so i just wasn't sure if uh what you guys felt about the camera work itself i i uh i i agree with you i think this is a thing that in Mike Shyamalan has always been taken to task for or celebrated, depending on who you are, because again, his stuff is divisive. Uh, the way his the cinematography in his movies is always a little bit, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's unique to him. Um, mm -hmm. Whether, you know, where he, where he puts the camera and I say he, cause there's a cinematographer who's doing it, but he's right. calling the shots here. Like there's certain, there's certain things that it's like, okay, well this, this, this image is tilted or this image is really low. And like, why would it be low or whatever the, like there's there's very dip there's there's a specific style to the way that he shoots things and it was very much on display in this um dutch angles and all that stuff like yeah. so it, it's um it i i think that it's an asset as well i think number one just the style like you want that you're seeing an m night Shyamalan movie why would you want something that's not an m night Shyamalan movie? like <laughs> if you if, if you're upset by that do you like other ones like it's that is his style mm -hmm. number two um specifically with the kids it's very interesting because they had to just by nature of what was happening in the movie they had to hide the kids at a point like they had yeah. to not show us what was happening with the kids because they couldn't realistically make that happen in a way that would be satisfying 
Um, right. They it, couldn't exactly. boyhood it and cast 12 different actors. You know, right, you, had exactly. to, you had to cast three and then be conscious of, okay, when we're going to show the next one, we want enough time to have passed to where it feels like they've naturally grown to that point, not just exactly. miraculously switched. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So they're, they're showing these kids, but they're only showing like their backs or their, or the, the you know, their hair or whatever like that. And you can hear them off screen. Um, and I think that was very effective because as, as the viewer, we kind of know what's going on at this point. Like, I don't think anybody's surprised about what the reveal is about to be at this point. Maybe some people are, but at this point, like we know what's going on and, and it makes sense in my brain. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, what I think is it, what I think is cool is that they, um, they do this thing where uh, it, it's the ET thing where he shoots it from a child's perspective, mm. except almost for the opposite effect, which is that the kid is um, the kid is the one who's actually being shown as bigger than uh than than uh they looked before like it it's doing it at the at the it's doing it at a low angle but the kid is standing so that he is showing he is actually much taller than the than, than that perspective which Absolutely. i think is was, is really good and it shows it shows that aging without having to show the kid because at that point they can't really show the kid yeah, that's really mm -hmm. smart. Yeah. Um, and then also just the the deafness and the blindness, like just using those techniques is really cool, too, because also, again, you don't want to be too grotesque with the with the horror uh, to a point where like, OK, giving this character this kind of blindness that creates just another cool stylistic element. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to kind of mask some of the darker like kind of images you might see otherwise, which I, which I think is cool. Yeah, uh, Carly, uses, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the style? Yeah. Yeah. He uses the style like he makes you anxious because you like want to see what's going on. Like, I think there's, like, one shot where he's just, like, circling the group and, like, you it just, it makes you wait to see, like, what people are saying and how they're reacting. And, like, you want to see more, but, like, it's done in a really effective way where it's not, like, you want to see more, but it's good that he makes, builds up that suspense and makes you wait before you can see it. Yeah, and, and I don't always notice, like, stylistic stuff with, with, with shooting at times, but with this one, I immediately noticed it because it was very flashing and in your face and... I can see why some people wouldn't love that, but yeah. I, I did. I loved it. I thought it was really effective and really cool. Yeah. Cause I think even like around the time the happening was coming out, he even said, he was like, I just want to make like the greatest B movie ever. And I think he's really been striving toward that. And, and has he done that? We'll have to, you know, find out with more co films that we'll cover on this show or otherwise, uh, and more films that come out. Oh, um, we're gonna I, do the happening at some point. Oh, I point know. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna do the happening. We'll probably end up doing a few more of his, but I do think like it is really cool to know that he is totally self-aware of what he's doing and i think that's kind of where we can't call this like an, a traditional frame wreck in that sense because he's quite aware that he is making these risks and taking these very interesting stylistic liberties to create an effect because he wants to kind of just create this like really interesting like twilight zone episode like it doesn't need to be taken seriously as like a masterpiece of elevated horror it can just be entertaining and have really distinct stylistic choices and another thing is also like it came out post pandemic so we were all still kind of at a heightened sense where like we get the themes and the themes are very real and honest and raw so it's okay that a little bit of the rest of the film feels a little foreign to where we cannot feel as immersed to where it gets uncomfortable like we can kind of say okay it's a movie because this and this and this it's a movie so now i don't feel as anxious like to kind of back, go back to what you're saying about the trailer matt like of you know like you're not constantly living in, in an anxiety that feels honest and truthful in the way like Michael Haneke's Amor makes you feel like, oh shit, like this is what aging is as raw as it is. This one, it's like, there's enough elements that can make you remind you that like, it is a movie at the end of the day. And like, mm -hmm. you can kind of separate yourself from it if you need to keep a distance because it was still raw and fresh at the time with the pandemic and all, you know? And for, for my money, I would rather have, I would take a happening or lady in the water uh, from M. Night, in M. Night Shyamalan style from M. Night Shyamalan than him giving me a Christopher Nolan quality style movie because that I love, like that's great. If it, I would rather have something from that that represents him, that's bad than something that that doesn't feel like him. And so, mm -hmm. to me, like you can't really, I can't really complain about even the bad uh, M Night Shyamalan movies because like they're very uniquely him, and it's mm -hmm. art, like. You don't have to, you don't go to a museum and love every painting. You don't have to love every painting. As long as the artist was true to themselves, that's the important thing. And that's how I feel about movies as well. Like, mm -hmm. that's what this show is. Like, the, most of the movies we cover on this is the artist being very true to themselves. Yes, we want to make fun of them, but 
that's what makes the movies great. That's because yeah. that that's that's the whole premise of our show. What makes this movie great? And usually it's from a bad a bad movie that we are calling great because of the things that the artists did intentionally very true to themselves. This in this case, we like this movie. This movie is great on its own, but I would rather have that than a than a better movie uh in a different style is how I feel. Yeah, I, I always love when a director will take a big swing rather than just doing something that's boring. It's like, even even if in the end it's not a good movie, it's like, okay, well, at least they like, at least they tried something. At least they tried to be ambitious. And one thing I love about M. Night Shyamalan is I believe he self-finances a lot of his movies. So it's like people will ask, oh, who gave him the money to do this? It's like, no one. He raised it himself so he can do what he wants to do and doesn't have to get approval from a big studio. He can yeah. just make a move make the movie that he wants to make and there's never any like question of oh did the studio stop him from doing this it's like no he made his movie and it's also like pandemic times how many directors were like i want to do this and they're like you can't covid um whereas he's like give me a beach and give me like a hotel and like there you go because now you can just quarantine the entire cast and crew at the hotel go shoot at the beach and you don't have to pay for all these different like things and, and go through all these different regulations i believe he filmed this in a bubble you know they filmed this in september 2020 so like it's really cool how he was like yeah i can make it work and and i think that's like a lot of his mantra as a filmmaker too is like making it work and catering his style to the budget he can he can get because he can you know he has that ability because he doesn't want to make a masterpiece again and i think there's something to be said about his whole trajectory as a filmmaker and why i think old is an essential piece of his filmmaking because it directly involves the concept of aging and time moving too fast how many people after unbreakable six sense and signs were like oh, he's the next spielberg you, know, you got to keep it up and then now every single film he's made since he has to try to live up to that and he's like he's probably thinking you know what I wish I had started slow. I wish I hadn't started so strong because now my career literally moved so fast that now I can't just enjoy experimenting, enjoy playing around because now there's this expectation set for me, which is kind of what this movie is. It's the idea that time is moving so fast and different people have different expectations of you. And now, now you've let your life kind of fly by because you can't just like enjoy the now and the here and uh, because the future is moving so fast. And I just think that's a really cool kind of parallel to his own, you know, filmography and also him as a father the idea that because he became such a success overnight so quickly he didn't have the time he wanted to spend with his daughters which is why now you're seeing movies like old and knock at the cabin and trap that are directly involving kids and his relationship to his kids like we saw it with signs as well but like you know the idea that now he wants to try to make up for lost time but he doesn't have that anymore because now Everyone sees him as the next Spielberg. He has to keep delivering at that height. He can't grow naturally. He was rushed into stardom, which I think is a really cool, you know, again, parallel to the idea of being rushed through time uh, that this film takes on. I don't know if you guys caught that or, or if you guys agree, but like, I do think that's a really cool element as well. If you want to like look at the meta of it, you know, um, I just love him. I love him so much. He's such a good director. And I do feel bad that they did put that pressure on him so early on in his career to keep delivering when you know what let him play let him have fun <laughs> you well, know I, I think despite that and, and you you actually said it yourself uh early in this uh in, earlier in that that what you were just saying is that uh he no longer he i mean he may have had that pressure but he's clearly not holding that i mean the person holding to that doesn't make lady in the water which was his follow-up to the village like uh yeah. the person like that doesn't make this movie or trap like he's no longer trying to live up to anything he's just making he's now building the sandcastles exactly and which which i think is which i think is wonderful <laughs> i i think i think yeah. that every director should do that i think that film criticism specifically internet film internet culture has gotten out of hand when it comes to this it the expectation that's put on filmmakers and the how quickly people write filmmakers off or uh, question their choices, especially before they've even seen the movie. Question their choices when what you need to do, like watch the movie, experience it, see what it is. You don't have to like it. You can be critical of it if you don't enjoy it. But at the, but it is art. It is somebody's art. Nobody nobody looks at a Van Gogh and says, "I wish he'd use less blue." Like <laughs> right. no one no one does that. You don't have to like Van Gogh. But you don't, you don't, you don't question why he like what he's doing or why he did the thing. 
Like mm. that's how I feel about film as well. People don't look at it as an art form en yeah. enough, in my opinion. Yeah. And I Directed think that he is an artist, and that's what he's doing. Yeah. Even if yeah. I don't love everything he does, it's a mixed bag for me. I, I'm between you guys on Trap. I, <laughs> I didn't like it as much as Dylan. I didn't dislike it as much as Carly. Uh, I thought it was fine, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's at least very him, and that's the important thing. Yeah, and, and I, I hate the idea of director jail. I just hate it. Like, Damien Chazelle makes three great, 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 great films. You know, Whiplash, La La Land, First Man. And now, because Babylon is not necessarily as widely acclaimed, even though I love it. I think, all we, all, I think we all three we all love, love it. it. Yeah. <laughs> but now, because Babylon, another masterpiece comes out that not everyone agrees is a masterpiece. Maybe, like, 30% don't think that. Um, now he's in director jail? Like, that's so crazy to me. Like, Is he in director jail? Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have anything lined up. I don't think. Like, I, I, I don't think any any studios want to take a chance on him now because of that. And I think it's just so silly because it's like, you know, now does Jordan Peele have to walk on eggshells that if he makes a fourth film and it's not as good as his first three or Greta Gerwig, like it now puts pressure on directors to now try to unmatch their past work. And it's like, look at look at Spielberg. He he hit it out of the park, but then he kind of like slowed down a bit and then he hit it back in the park in in the 90s with, with Jurassic Park and Schindler's List like he never he wasn't always giving us Jaws's and E.T.'s every single time but he you know he took some cooldowns to then really come back swinging and, and I feel like that's what every director should be given the chance to do uh so I agree yeah and let me just say this isn't a new thing either I remember back in 2003 2004 whatever year it came out when Jersey Girl came out me having to be like having to talk Kevin Smith fans off a ledge being like, they're like, I guess he's done. I'm like, he's not done. Yeah, he, right. he made a, a movie you don't like. Mm -hmm. I personally really like Jersey Girl. Yeah. I think that I think it gets way too much hate. Uh, but it's like, it, it's the same thing. It, and and I had to point out like, okay, dude who made Amelie made, made uh, Alien Resurrection. And then he made another movie that everybody yeah. loved. Like, it's not like people just stop making good movies because they made one you don't like right it's the same thing and i think kevin smith is actually a good comparison to Shyamalan because now he's just kind of doing his own thing and, and oh yeah you know his his movies don't even get full wide releases because he's like i'm just gonna make fun movies like i'm not i'm not concerned about being the next great you know he, well, he doesn't want he that started Oscar. his he, he started his career making movies with his friends and uh and that was his whole thing and even when he made chasing amy they were like we want schwimmer we want we want uh uh someone else like they're like we want these people and he's like i just want to make it with my friends they're like you can't just make movies with your friends he's like yes i can and then he made it with friends and then he kind of went to the step in the studio and went wait whoa i need to go back to making movies with my friends which is what he's doing he's just like playing with his friends uh and that's and and we that's what we want we don't want the other thing stop yeah. trying to make filmmakers do the thing we don't want i don't yeah. know why this happens well, I think Shyamalan, it's the same thing. It's like he did like Last Airbender and After Earth, these big like studio temple, Will Smith, big movie star. And then he's like, you know what? No, I just want to make fun little B movie Twilight Zone episodes. And you know what? Mm -hmm. I like them. I think we all yeah, do. So, um, yeah. Carly, any thoughts on just Shyamalan in general and, and all that? Um, no, he's one that I want to see more from because I haven't seen a lot of his big ones. Like, I haven't seen Signs. I haven't seen The Village. I haven't seen The Visit. Um, I haven't seen The Happening, which I really want to get to. Um, but yeah, I just I love directors that make big swings and you know his movies are always they're always entertaining even if even if I don't love them um, like I didn't like Trap that much but I, I was glad like he made a big swing with it because it's it's a very unique premise that I don't think many people would think of so right. yeah I just I, I love that he makes big swings and mm -hmm. I, I'm excited to see whatever he does next. Yeah, which transitions us, I think, to now talking about his twists, because that is like the kind of thing you think about with M. Night Shyamalan. This one does have one. It has a pretty big one, I'd say, um, you know, kind of the motive behind why these people are on the beach to begin with, mm -hmm. which like if you're already this far, you've probably seen old. Um, we spoiled a lot of it already, but three, two, one, um, you know, they are being put on this beach as like medical test subjects. They give them these cocktails uh, with medicines and based on they basically need the increased rapid aging to see how its long-term effects are going to be or how long are these medicines going to work for type deal. Um, which is why we see like the epileptic patient, you know, she ends up making it pretty deep into her life before she starts having these epileptic seizures again, you know, and it's kind of a way to like test that without needing years and years and years of, of proof and research, which I think is a really cool idea. I, I like the twist when I first saw it. I don't know right. about you guys. I, I, I do. There's, it's fun. Cause you mentioned the, the epileptic, 
the, the epileptic uh, patient, um, once the thing wears off, which is something like seven and a half years or, or no, 16 and a half years is what they yeah. said. 16 and a half years worth of time that she spent without uh, without a seizure. Um, once you see that moment happening, um, you realize that like that's what it would have been like for her the, from the moment she stepped on the thing without the medicine. Because what happens during that seizure is she keeps starting and stopping. So she has a seizure and then it stops, but then time the time catches up to where her next one is immediately. And she has mm -hmm. another immediate seizure. And that happens until she dies. She would have died within minutes of being on the island on that beach if she hadn't had that cocktail, which I think is very interesting. That's a very good explanation in the theory. This, from what I read, I haven't read Sandcastle. From what I read, this is not part of Sandcastle. Uh, this is the part that he added. Uh, so Sandcastle is added. just like the horror of aging rapidly, and that's it. And on 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 the yeah, okay. they don't ever explain why that happens on the on this mm. beach, but that but that's what the story is. Um, so, so this is not part of Sandcastle. So this is this was this was fully uh, Shyamalan. Um, interesting. And uh, I, it's 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 very interesting because okay, so there's things about um, there's things within this that I immediately was able to clock that these are these are setting up for something else. Um, every time the kid was asking someone's name and occupation, I was like, okay. This is going to come back up. There's a reason he's asking all these people this stuff. And there always was. Uh, they kept mentioning people's ailments. I was like, okay, this is coming back up. They are setting us up for something like that. The thing that they hid very well was how they were getting the cocktail into them, which was the which was the or the the, 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 alcohol, the drug into them, which was through the cocktail. Which is uh, just something they, you do when you go to like all these private resorts. It's like, oh, right. here's a drink. Welcome to paradise, you know, which I think is a fun, cool, cool trick. Carly, do you want to talk about the twist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I really like it. I I think it's I think it's really fun to have this where it's just this big conspiracy that they like lured them here, and um, I think I think they, it was because they want they said they won a contest or something, so no one's gonna look into it. Yeah, it was like a sweepstakes on their once they got the prescription from their doctor. So what they must have done is like go to different doctors and and find patients who have these ailments and and be like, here, offer them this subscription or this sponsorship or the sweepstakes, and and they can come get like a private vacation, which is really just gonna be like this test facility, which I think is cool. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I just I really like the twist. I think it's I think it's. I think it's really fun um, and it's just interesting how like you see the whole old island for a while and then you don't see the twist till like you think everyone's dead. Like then you mm -hmm. see him at the end and you're yeah. like, wow. And you uh, think the movie's going to end with them escaping, but it ends up being, <laughs> oh, we're also going to get answers for all the questions. Right. Then it ends um, five more times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, sorry, I had to do the with the kid. That's why I, I, I blanked away. Um, the, uh, what I think is interesting, uh, the interesting thing about the way the twist is revealed is because at the point before they uh, reveal what it is, I'm like, gosh, this guy is just dastardly. Like this guy, obviously they sent them the, the, the manager of the hotel. I was like, he chose that family and was like, here family go die together. Like he knew what was going to happen. Um, it, because obviously he did. Cause that's why he sent like he sent those people all there. Uh, and so I'm thinking, gosh, he's just, this guy is just evil. He turns out he is like it's still wrong. What he's done is still wrong. It just does make him feel. It does feel less like like random evil, which I think is good. That that, that gives some context to it, and it makes him feel yeah. less like he's just the worst guy who's sending these children to die, which he is. Right. Yeah, but, there's motivation because the kids don't have not. any sort of uh, ailments, right? They don't have any no, diseases. Yeah. They're just guilty by association or not guilty, but they are by association of the parents who, who, yeah, ever. So it's the mother has a tumor, but she also ends up being deaf. Is that what it is? Or the she, deafness she, just the comes deaf, with old deafness age. Deafness happens with the old age. Okay. Um, uh, and the father, does he have anything wrong with him? I mean, he the gets father blindness, doesn't right? have anything wrong with him. It's the mother who has a tumor. The, okay. um, the doctor has schizophrenia. Right. We, the, yeah. His wife has a calcium deficiency. Um, uh, mid size sedan had a uh, <laughs> an iconic, <laughs> iconic joke like the fact that all these rappers have crazy names and they named them, you know, mid size sedan. Mid Perfect joke. Mid size Perfect. sedan had a blood clotting issue. Yes. Um, uh, the one the, woman with the, 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 the nurse's wife had a had a had epilepsy, mm -hmm. and I think that is all of the ailments. Unless yeah. I missed so, something. 
so yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt. Like, I kind of picked up that it was leading somewhere to do with like, okay, all of them have something wrong with them. I thought it was mm -hmm. more of just like a social experiment, kind of like a survivor yeah. thing. Like, what would happen if you, you know, put them on an on an island and or or it was like, you know, we can't afford to to treat these patients anymore, so let's just get it over with quickly. And I thought it was going to be a commentary on like euthanasia, um, mm -hmm. but it ends up being something more interesting and abstract and and the villains actually have motivations and we don't really see the villains and, and the noble end. motivations whether they are bad like obviously they're bad right. like you should not do this you can't you right. can't put people in a trial without their consent you can't you can't put them in, on this island to die without their consent um mm -hmm. but uh so so the, the 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 motivations are at least noble but still bad like still evil but they're at least not not uh they're they're not unrelenting evil without any yeah. real it's, like it's ultimately a... trying to cure all these illnesses yeah. which is like an admirable thing but it's but it also shows that like okay for, for all the people who are like again bringing it back to covid who were like well i'm not taking the vaccine because i don't know in 30 years i might have this might happen to me or we all might die in 40 years 50 years but it's i think it's playing to that same idea of like would you rather know now or just like trust the process and hope and like, I, I think it honestly gives a good commentary on how like doctors, they don't know the answers because you can't do this. You can't speed up time to see how all these things are going to work or not work, but they are the best in their field and you have to trust them to some degree and like hope that like, you know, you know, we're all working on it together. And that's why charity is important to fund these, this research and get this, you know, these medicines discovered and find ways to cure them. But there is also no, you know, you can't rush time. You have to just like, sadly you have to just kind of be part of the circle of life and hope that you know hope hope you find a cure by the time you need it um which i think is just a very interesting commentary again about just like the medical world and, and all that stuff too like i, I find this twist really cool like i, I think yeah. it's just a really cool pivot where it makes it actually feels like something that like if the fantasy element of the rapidly aging beach could exist. This feels like a very natural thing that would happen to people. It's like essentially when you test things on mice, it's just now you're using humans, which is like fucked up, but it's also like, it, it makes sense that characters would do this if they had the ability to, which I think is scary, but also like, it doesn't feel out of the realm of possibility. Does that make sense? And yeah. And you could do this with consent. Like if there's someone oh, who's yeah. terminal or, or which I mean, I get like some of them, it's like, okay, some of this is not going to be terminal in the in the sense that uh like they would they would die within a day and a half because due to it like but you could get people with consent to to do this especially if you had an exit plan which clearly there's a possibility there's a way to leave that island like that mm -hmm. beach um so if they could do that with an exit i think that that's i think you could get people to do this with consent there is a way to ethically do this they just didn't do that. Yeah. I, I do really like that comment they make where they're like, well, we, we, we've we got this island for a reason, so we have to use it. Like, it's so sinister and, like, just the fact that they're like, well, well, we are doing it for the right reasons. Um, yeah. And just the fact that they're like, well, well, obviously we have to use the island. Like, mm -hmm. like kind of trying to push it off as, like, it's not our fault. God gave us the island, so obviously <laughs> we have to use it, so... Yeah. That's just kind of an interesting throwaway comment they make near the end. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this twist. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about his other twists because I know we all haven't seen every movie of his, but like, you know, I, I think this is one of his better twists because there is at least that like logic. It doesn't come out of complete nowhere, even though it is not part of the source material, which I think is even more brilliant because it's like he thought of this himself. He's like, we need to find a way to make a social commentary that is not just time slips away and you got to cherish every moment. You know, like it's like he wanted to think a little bit deeper and have something else to say, which I think is cool. I, I Again, this is a, what we've all been saying. Like we appreciate the bold swings, even if some people don't like them. Um, but but I, I've kind of struggled. Like what do people not like? Like I've heard people just say the dialogue or the style, but like I... I I, I'm trying to look at it from that framework perspective. And, and I don't know, Matt, if you can help because you just watched it. But like, what is it about this film that you think people just aren't vibing with? Because I, I don't understand why this is the one that everyone's like, well, this one sucks. Because like Last Airbender gets it too. Lady in the Water gets it. But like the happening, I think people have come around on. But this one, I feel like some people like looking at the Rotten Tomatoes as well, like only a third of people like it. And I, and I, I don't understand it. Well, I, I would say this would be a good opportunity for us to do because this is a redemption. Instead of a train wreck moment, we do a what they were right about. Um, okay, so I yeah, can give you, I can give you an aspect that I think uh, may not work in that, or may may 
be a problem for some people, and that is how convoluted the plot is. It doesn't okay. really hold up under scrutiny if you think about it too long. However, okay. as I mentioned, and I even mentioned this in our in our Indiana Jones uh, uh, redemption, is that I think we basically should accept the physics of the world that they built. Unless they contradict it in the movie, we should just accept what they are telling us as truth in the universe that the movie has set. So for me, I don't feel like they contradict themselves in this movie at all. So we can just we can we can hand wave that away. We can just pretend that this that the science of this works, and maybe it does. I'm not a scientist, but it does feel convoluted and and uh, and questionable at times. That's fair. That I think is a big is a big part of it. That 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 might be, and that's that's where I would say, yeah, they're right about that. But also, hmm. it's just the movie. That's how like just trust, just just turn. Suspend your disbelief and let the movie right. be what it is, is, is how I feel. But yeah, I think that's that's part of it. Yeah, I hate the term like turn your brain off, but like you kind of have to at a point. Because also I there is it. enough to grasp onto if you're not overthinking it. Like the, the, the themes are very general. You can get what the themes are. So mm -hmm. like just enjoy it. Um Carly, what, what would you say is like the what they were right about, like the critics of this? Like um, I would it, say, though I love this aspect, the multiple endings. Um, okay, that was mine too. Yeah. Yeah. So like first they die and you're like, okay, the movie's probably over. Then they like show the guy going to the medical lab and like, okay, now it's going to end. And then they show up at the resort and you're like, okay, it'll end here. And then they show like the flashback to them escaping and then finally they're on a helicopter and it ends. So like there's like several times when it could end and it just doesn't. And like I can get why people would be like, that's that's silly. Like you should have just ended it at like a strong point when you could have. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but I love it. I love that it's like, oh, is it over? No, nope. yeah. no. Nope. I think the natural ending point is where they push the cocktails out of her hand and then they say their names and then that could be where you cut. I think that's the most cool. logical end point because then it's like, oh, cool, they survived and now they're going to get to save everyone by telling them what's up. I think the extra bonus of like, oh, she's stuck on the reef. Oh, no, they got to get through the reef. Oh, and now there's a helicopter. Like, that stuff is the extra added stuff. That's kind of what mine was too because I was like, I feel like that extra beat isn't necessarily because we already know they get, end up at the resort, you know? Right. It uh, For me, um, yeah, I don't think you have to tell us how they got out. I think I think, well, for me, it's like, I didn't think they were dead. Like, I, I assumed that they were going to show up. Um, I assumed there was something. I actually thought, by the way, the look he gives her when they're underwater uh, and before they cut to all oh, they're dead, um, I thought he was about to leave her behind. And I was like, oh, this is about to get dark. For, <laughs> this is about to get darker than it was before. Um, but uh, that obviously didn't happen. I think I agree with you. If they knock cocktails out of their hands and uh say their names because and the names happened off screen too like mm -hmm. or you kind of see them at, it's doing that et thing uh yeah where the, everyone else you're seeing everyone else's reaction too yeah yeah um so it's it's uh it, it yeah i think that that is a natural end point as well uh it does because after beyond that it does kind of uh lose a little bit for me uh he goes to the cop and that's why we learned that that guy was a cop Right. Uh, oh, and then he also goes back to the kid and like holds up the the, the cipher, which I, I think is yeah. cute. Like you could end it there too. Like they, they, you can have a moment I mean, with him and the that's kid. That's cute, but I I don't think that that's I don't think that that I think that I don't think that brings uh, improves it more than ending it where we had talked about. I think that it, where we had talked about is probably the best place. Also, that uh, they're going back to their aunt is like her six year old nephew is now a fifty year old man or whatever. That that stuff feels unnecessary and. I think that this film is served better making us think about the fact that he's a 50 year old man mm -hmm. who used to be 60 or who used to be six, um, uh, making us wonder how, how they're going to, uh, how they're going to feel about that after, uh, than show, showing us that he is thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that showing us that, uh, actually makes it feel a little bit, I don't know. There's something I can't explain it exactly, but I think that you know, leaving that mystery about how they are going to deal with that is yeah. better, and so they should cut that part out. Of you know what they could have done is is do the Murph thing from Interstellar, where you have one character that you meet earlier on that stays behind, that's not like a little kid, but like maybe a middle aged person, and then when they get back, they're like an old 
actually no it would be the other way around cuz the, the people on the on the land are not aging yeah. they're aging all right never right. mind um but i guess that's what they're kind of kind of doing with the kid and him where he's like oh my god you're yeah. older now um because yeah. like that's the power of interstellar for me is at the end when murph comes home, where when coop comes home and he sees murph old it's like look at how mm-hmm. much time i lost um but now it's kind of the other way around where the old people are coming home to the young um so yeah never mind <laughs> i was i was thinking i was like oh that could be really emotional but you know what yeah i, I think they could have picked the point to end it sooner but again like it's the very end so it's where that point i'm sold it's not like then i hate right. that like if, if people are watching a movie and they're like oh the ending sucked this movie sucks i'm like no, well i mean like it can make it worse but like you can't just say the movie sucks because of the ending unless it completely contradicts everything that came before from like uh, like an actual thematic perspective where it kind of just like tells you everything you've been watching is is not is not what it actually is like that's different right. but um yeah, so I, I guess we all kind of agree on that that aspect. But yeah, I was just curious to like what what the other people out there that don't like this film. And, and if you're watching this and you don't like it, let us know in the comments what you don't like about it. Because I think, you know, I, I really fail to see why people aren't at least entertained by it. You know, a lot of people say right. it's boring. I'm like, really? Like, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't, you know, subscribe to that. But personally, right. yeah, I don't know. I agree. Um, okay. Uh, do we want to talk, do we... Did you have other points to, to point, or should we get on to our spurlers? No, I think we could do some spurlers. Carly, you have anything else to say about old before we get into the specifics? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, let's talk about our best actor. I'm going to start on this one because mm. uh, there is an actor that I thought – there's an actor and a character that I thought was extremely useful in this movie uh, that leaves too early, um, and that is uh, Ken Leung from uh, – who who, uh, who is the nurse uh, mm. who – is the only effective character uh, on that beach. Uh, and for some reason, they allow him to swim out. It's like, why? No, anybody but him needs to swim. He's the only person who's doing anything good on this on this beach. Um, uh, full disclosure, Ken, Ken uh, Leung is on lost in a, mm-hmm. uh, later seasons of lost and i really enjoy him on that as well but yeah. i think he's great in this i think that as an actor as a character both things he's just really great and because and mm-hmm. he's also kind of the audience as i into a lot of it too like it's obviously yeah. from the child's perspective but him asking a lot of the questions um yeah. being like am i am i getting duped like are you you're you're, you're six really yeah. you're, six? you're 11 you're like really yeah. you're 11 okay and and wait are these not your kids am i being duped like i, th- I think that's that's fun um yeah carly what do you think of ken leong yeah, yeah i thought yeah he wasn't one the first one that popped in my head but um now that you're saying it i'm like yeah that actually that's a really good performance and he is the only reasonable person on that beach <laughs> um carly who is your uh best actor in this Okay, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. Um, it's the it's the racist guy, Rufus um, Sewell. 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 Sewell? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I could just say Rufus him. Tool because I also I too picked Rufus Sewell. Mm. I loved him. His delivery of some of the lines was great. Like he he's so good at playing that asshole. Um, there's one point where like everyone's like arguing and he just says, um, what does he say? He, just, he says, do you know about movies? And it just cracks me up <laughs> every single time. It's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I go, ahead, Matt. I, go ahead. Oh no, just, I, I, I love that guy. Uh, he's, he's, he's a great villain in a lot of things. Um, and uh, a Knight's Tale, he's the, he's the villain in that movie as well. Mm. Um, but he's a great villain in a lot of things. Rufus Sewell. I, I think that, uh, I'm glad he was in this. I think that his character is really good. Um, he's very unreasonable. And then you find out he has schizophrenia and like, that's, pro- that's what, what's happening to him mm. uh, throughout it. But he plays that rich asshole really well in this as well. Uh, and, and the way he at the, you know, with the way he is uh, condescending to uh, the nurse at the beginning, when, when his wife is having a, a, a seizure and he goes over and, the nurse is like, I'm handling this. And then he comes over and he's like, I'm a doctor. He's like, all right, do these things. It's exactly what he's already doing. Like mm-hmm. that whole, uh, I like that character a lot. And I think Rufus Sewell plays it uh, really, really well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. Like, I, I think he's a great dick. I think he's the one who's also like really, really harsh and cruel to Anthony Hopkins in The Father. Um, mm. You know, you know yeah. uh, he plays like the, the boyfriend of the daughter or whatever uh, caretaker. Um, but yeah, he's just so good. And, and what I love about it is his character, which again, is not the performance, but his character in general is, you know, 
an added element of surprise. It's kind of like that real random kind of factor in it all because everyone else is dying based on their aging naturally, but he's someone who is actively going after and targeting people for means that are not medical. Like he's the one who kills mid-sized sedan. He's the one who's like kind of, you know, harming these people violently to where it like, I, I think it's a really interesting kind of other element to it where it's not just that they're all dying, but now you have this person who's quite literally, literally trying to kill you on top of that, which just adds to the conflict of it and brings in that racist element, but also brings in that like empathy of like, Oh, but he's also schizophrenia, schizophrenic, which I also think is interesting. Cause like, I don't think schizophrenia is something that like, actively can like kill you maybe i don't know i don't know too much about schizophrenia but like is it is it a condition where you could like die from or is it just like a I, well I don't know. you you can die from and uh, you can die from the uh you know, the physical effects of the what stress. you do during during exactly. while having it. it's similar to and it's not i was about to say it's similar to age it's not similar to AIDS. but people who die from aids don't die from aids they die from pneumonia or whatever something a complication associated with it gotcha, gotcha. you're not going to die from schizophrenia you're going to die yeah. from uh from walking into traffic or something not not specifically that but like something an right. event it kind of puts your own life. kind of state your immune system and your mental state which in, which in, in this case very he risky, did like, way. yeah he died because he was attacking someone because he didn't really understand what he was doing. Yeah. And yeah. I just think it's a really interesting character to add to the mix because yeah. it's not just all these people dying of, of illnesses. It's him now because of his illness, he is now inflicting harm on others. Um, it just adds an extra f factor to where like, yeah, the real villains are the ones who put them on this island. But now you add this other extra kind of person to, to deal with. Um, I, yeah. I just think it's really cool. Yeah, and then they have right. that line about how um, someone, one of the scientists is like advocating being like, we should really separate this guy from the other people <laughs> yeah. led to us not getting as much research. Yeah. Right. I yeah. But also just his Definitely eyes, agree. just the way he kind of conveys the emotion with his eyes too. Like there's so many good close ups with him as well. So yeah, I, I, I agree. He's my favorite. Um, uh, I, I would like to point out one who uh, actually this whole cast is really great. So it's, it's really good. I, uh, I, you know, talk about uh, uh, Alex Wolf who, uh, apparently was on a naked something about naked brothers. Uh, yeah, naked brothers. I've, heard, yeah, I've heard of that before, but I don't know. First thing I ever saw him in was Hereditary. Uh, so I think oh, great. Cool. Thompson McKenzie, uh, who again I can't even as an adult can't really think about her as not a child. That's why, <laughs> yeah. even though right. I loved late, late, last night in Soho, uh, it was really weird for me. Um, it is, yeah. um, but uh, I want to shout out Abby Lee, who uh, what was that? That's her name, right? Abby Lee. Uh, yeah, she's the, the one who the, the pretzel, yeah. the human pretzel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. Um, I want to shout her out because although I wouldn't put her in my favorite actors in this thing, she was the MVP of, in my opinion, the MVP of Horizon Chapter One. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That I was wondering where I'd seen her. You're so right. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I I, did, I had that same moment recently when I saw Saturday Night as Ella Hunt in that place, uh, Gilda Radner. She's also in that show Dickinson with uh, Haley Steinfeld. And I was mm -hmm. like, where have I seen her before? And she's the one on the Oregon Trail plot line for Horizon. And I was just like, wow, like all these Horizon actors that I'm like, oh yeah, that's them from Horizon. <laughs> I love these big cast movies. Cause also like, these are the types of movies where you can't get like a Brad Pitt or Leonardo DiCaprio for with the budget. But like, they're all really great actors, but they're all just like B list enough to where like, they're all like that guy actors. It's like Guy Garcia Barnell. It's like, oh, that guy. Um, you know, and I love that about this cast. It's all a lot of a lot of that guys, which I love. Like Eliza Scanlon. I'm like, where do I know? Oh, she's that one from Little Woman. Little Women. She's she's Beth. Mm -hmm. Um, like I really like that. I, I like those little elements, and she's great as well. She's someone I also want to yeah. bring up. Um, oh, this whole cast is so good. Even the kids, the like very, very Vicky Creeps, amazing. Like she's done what this and Phantom Thread. Like get her more work, please. Yeah. Um. Uh, but again, another that guy. Like you think Phantom Thread, you think Daniel Day Lewis, but it's like no, she she's the lead of Phantom Thread as well. Um, yeah. I love her. I love this whole cast. Um, yeah, what's the next superlative, Matt? Uh, let's talk about a favorite line of dialogue. Who has a, who wants to go first? Um, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, okay. So this line of dialogue, I just love it because it's so expositiony. Um, maybe it has to do with the fact that the cells in hair and nails are dead, and they aren't reacting the same in the same way like it's it's so obviously like people are going to question this so i'm going to put this line in the movie and like it, it just kills me every time it's so good it's very good it's it's yeah. very good yeah yeah matt what was, what's yours uh mine is uh mine is a, a 
quote that I really like just in life now, but it also is kind of a uh, thesis for this movie. And that is when the mom says, to, to, and at the beginning of the movie says to a uh, little six-year-old Trent, stop wishing this, stop wishing away this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. When, when it, cause they're, they're like traveling and talking and stuff like that. And he's like, you said we'd be there in 30 minutes, but we're not. And uh, she says, stop wishing away this moment, which is yeah. really the thesis for this film. Like, cause <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's very yeah. good. Oh, I love that. Um, my favorite, I, I went at this at the kind of frame wreck lens where it's an entertaining line of dialogue that I laughed at because um, it's silly, but I also love it. Um, it's when <laughs> the uh, so whoever goes out to swim and then comes back dead or whatever, uh, it's like Midsize Sedan's wife or, or girlfriend or whatever. Um, and Midsize Sedan is explaining it. He's like, yeah, she was just doing the breast breaststroke. Um, she was swimming out there. You know, she was fine. She had MS, but she was swimming like really. She was like Michael Phelps out there. And then the girl goes, um, what did you say? And then he says, it may have been a butterfly stroke. I don't watch the Summer Olympics. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're trying to be like, wait, what did you say? She was swimming and now she's just dead. But he took that as like, what? wait, what? What stroke was he? doing he's like no the butterfly <laughs> stroke i don't know i don't watch the summer olympics i thought that was really funny because it was also the deadpan delivery of bit size today yeah. like i don't know it could have been a butterfly stroke i don't watch the summer olympics like it was just so funny um just like creative shit like that but like not many people could just come up with like like this yeah, comment like no, this little good. misunderstanding it just adds flavor to it i love it um uh, you both picked good frame wreck uh quotes and i picked a, uh, a no but that is that is a perfect yeah. perfect quote yeah, yeah perfect I love redemption. That. Um, all right, so let's talk about the best scene. Uh, Dylan, what's your favorite scene? In this um, because I look at this as a master of body horror, I would say the pretzel for me is always like the, mm. uh, like it, it just makes me easy, queasy, geezy. Um, but I do think the sandcastle scene is really profound and it's the one that I was most emotionally touched by because he's just like so innocent. He's like, you want to build a sandcastle? And like, I could see how people could like laugh at this and be like, that's so stupid. These two adults playing sandcastles, but it also reminds you, it's like, no, they're kids. They're still mm -hmm. just kids who wanted to have a fun day at the beach. You know, they were sitting in the car all day yesterday and now they're, they're building sandcastles, even though they know their lives are wasting away. It's like, it's just them. Let's have a nice private, beautiful yeah. moment between the two. I, I, love I think, that. I think those people should stop wishing this moment away. Uh, which was my <laughs> quote from earlier. Uh, King. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, the the pretzel scene, uh, which is the, the first one you had mentioned there, uh, I really like that scene as well. It, it wasn't uh, my pick, but it was almost my pick. What I liked about it is the uh, is the filmmaking uh, convention that they use, which is that he it's only lit by the match that they're that the matches they're lighting. They keep yeah. having to light new oh. matches. So we're not seeing her contort. We're seeing we're it's lining up. We're seeing what did what it looks like after she has contorted and it mm. has healed that way. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's it's very good. I love it. I love it. Uh, and I spoke about the sandcastle scene earlier. Yeah. It's a very beautiful, wonderful scene that gave me anxiety because yes. I don't have much time. Matt, was that your uh, pick? Was the contortion? No, no, no. Okay, no. so what is your? pick? It wasn't my pick. It was just it was. I just wanted to comment on it. Gotcha, gotcha. We'll go ahead with your pick. Oh, I would thought Carly might want to talk about the pretzel scene or the same. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Carly. Yeah, Anything I, to add on the pretzel? I, I love a good human pretzel. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, Carly, what was your favorite scene? Uh, it has to be the tumor opening, the opening, mm, the one, oh, yeah, tumor yeah, yeah. removal. Like, yeah, that's that's the first thing I think of when I think of this movie. So, it's love that. Good. I agree. Um, okay, my favorite scene, um, and, and it was my because it was the most striking image to me the first time I watched it and the second time it felt much more effective, even though I think I would have changed something about it. My favorite scene was the freeze tag scene with the kids um, because it's almost the opposite of what's happening. Like there are all these that everything's moving so fast, but they're taking these moments to, to play and be kids and they are free. They are freezing in time while everything else is, 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 uh, it's speeding up in time. It's awesome. Um, the way that it shot is so good because it comes up. It's almost like it felt like in the early nineties or in the late nineties, when we first saw the matrix and we first saw the, uh, the camera move while, it, while a, while a person was still on screen. Uh, and it, that's what it felt like. Cause the first time you see the boy, uh, tri uh Trent, is frozen and the camera is panning past him and he's frozen and it's like it looks really cool um and then it 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 doesn't cut it cut it, it tracks out to um the 
the two uh, girls playing and uh, uh, Thomas and McKenzie's character, who is a child. It's not Thomas McKenzie yet. I forget the character name all of a sudden. Anyway, uh, she... Um, Maddox. Maddox, thank you. Uh, which, by the way, what a sweet moment when the guy asks, who's your best friend, Trent? And he says, Matt, or what's your best friend's name? And uh, he says, Maddox uh, yeah, is the, okay. the sweetest moment. Uh, it's yeah. so sweet. Anyway, not that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> Maddox and, and the little girl are, the Maddox is chasing the little girl. And uh, the little girl touches the uh, Trent and he runs off because he was frozen. And then Maddox tags uh, the little girl and then she freezes. And it just, it's so beautifully shot and it, it's very striking to me. And I thought maybe the first time I found it so striking because I didn't, because I, I wasn't expecting it or something. But the second time I watched it through, still was like, that's such a cool scene. Uh, that that's mm. why it's my favorite. I would have changed a little bit because they do close up on the little girl at that point. Um, that she is frozen long enough that maybe we could have seen her age just a little bit in that moment, mm. which we don't. But I think that would have been a good, nice little added bonus to it. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. The scene is so cool. I really like mm. it. Next time you guys watch it, watch that scene closely because it's very, very good. No, I love it. It's great. Uh, Carly, any thoughts on that scene? Um, no, well, next time I watch the movie, I will pay more attention yeah. to that scene. You brought up something really interesting when you were like, uh, I wish we could have seen her age a little bit. I, I, we haven't really talked about it, but the age makeup is really good because it mm. has to be so gradual. And, and like the kids, it's easy, but like for the adults, like especially Gail Garcia Barnal, like. I really like the very subtle like addition of some wrinkles as the film goes on. Another underrated <laughs> element. Cause obviously the body horror is great for like the scarring when like mid size sedan and Vicky creeps, like they get their cuts and they immediately heal. But I think also what's underrated is the actual aging makeup to make them look older. And, and, and they really do zoom the camera so close in that you can't hide those effects, which I think, which I think is cool. So uh, um, shout out to them. What, what's cool is that uh, Gail Garcia Bernal and Deo Luna, uh, were in films a lot uh, er early in their career together. Mm -hmm. um, and Diego Luna, who plays Ca uh, Cassian Andor uh, in Star Wars, uh, doesn't seem to have aged a day since then, but Gal Garcia <laughs> Renal has. Uh, I think it would have been funny if, if Diego Luna had also been in this and by the end looked exactly the same. Uh, but that's just me. <laughs> that's not important that. there. But I agree. The yeah. age makeup was good and, and subtle and... and uh, and uh, was specific to characters because uh, Abby Lee's character, you don't really see much of the age on there, but you do see uh, her makeup running and, and she covers herself up a lot. But like when it cuts back to her, you can see that something is wrong and different and it's not yeah. how she wants to be. Like, yeah, it's very so, subtle, but I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's like you could watch minute five and minute 50 mm -hmm. and there's such a stark contrast, but minute five and minute 10 you don't realize that subtle change. It's kind of like boyhood where if you watch the very first scene and the last scene, it's like, wow, he grew up. But if you watch the first scene and the second scene, you don't realize they take place a year apart until you realize, you know what I mean? Like, cause he's mm -hmm. aging gradually. You don't, again, you don't notice it until, you know, time has passed. You look back and you're like, wow, mm -hmm. you looked so different back then. Um, which is fascinating. Um, yeah. Cool. All I mean, right. Superlatives. Yeah. Uh, that's all the superlatives. Now we, uh, now we move on to, well, normally we'd move on a legacy. We kind of talked about it. Uh, I will say that old grossed forty three or forty eight point three million in the United States and Canada, and forty one point nine million in other territories for a world, worldwide total of ninety point two million, which is not terrible, especially for something self finance. Um, yeah. And post it, 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 it wasn't. It was still seen as a weak opening because that movie and uh, Snake Eyes opened on the same week and. Right. And uh, they both were kind of weak. It was just kind of a weak, 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 mm -hmm. week. I think it was an August week, week. horror, too, which yeah. August typically isn't great. So. Um, this film does have a 50% or did. I don't I don't know that it's true anymore, but it did have a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, I think it's which lower. makes it's lower now. I think it's 43 or 33 or something like it's it's lower yeah. now. Yeah. But it did, uh, according to Wikipedia, when it came out, it had a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it's which, got a 46 from top critics and a 50 from all critics and an audience okay. and a 43 for all audience and a 53 for verified. So, okay. Yeah. So, so it kind of puts it right in the middle. I have a, I have a complaint just in general about rotten tomatoes. I don't, I think that rot, people use rotten tomatoes wrong anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, cause they consider that, that number a 
a uh, quality statement. Quality yeah. stamp. Sta- like it's fifty percent not... good. It's like no, it's fifty percent no, people it's think 50... it's good. Yeah. Which and but uh, Rotten Tomatoes won't consider something fresh unless it's sixty percent, which doesn't make sense because at fifty percent, it's half the people. Like mm-hmm. you're, there, there's a ten percent of people that they are not like. I don't. I don't like that. I think that it should be a fifty percent. It's fresh. Anyway. Yeah. Or um, like separate ratings, like maybe something at fifty and something at eighty. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And and they do have they do have like certified fresh for if it stays fresh at a certain amount of critics for a certain amount of time or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it it bothers me that when yeah. someone it bothers me especially and, and this is just a rant about Rotten Tomatoes for just a second. Um, it bothers me when someone will look at a score on Rotten Tomatoes, see that it's rotten and say, well, it got 53%. And I said, well, that means the majority of people liked it, but the thing is green. So that means it's rotten. Right. Or they'll fun. say, I think it should be higher. I'm like, you think more critics should like it? Like, like yeah. it's more like, it, it's not an objective same on quality. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's like it's, just, it's just showing you what the critic consensus is in terms of liking right. or disliking. And rot- to me, Rotten Tomatoes is good for uh, getting a bunch of critics and I can look at the ones that I care about because I don't agree with all those people. So their their score on it doesn't do anything. That's why, that's why I like Letterbox because you can see a curve. So if it's like, if there's a lot over here, you know it's it's uh, poorly reviewed. If it's a lot over here, you know it's well reviewed and you look at a curve. If it's kind of like in the middle, it means like everyone thinks it's like just average, you know? And I, I like that. Yeah. And you could also click just friends. You could see your just friends curve of like uh, what your friends see. So like, I, I'll pull it up right now. Old right now on Letterbox has a 2.4 average, which is, I think, a little low. But, um, you know, you can kind of see how the curve, there's not a lot of 9 and 10s over here. There's about, you know, a bunch of like 6, 7, 8s, but a lot of like 4s as well. But then if you click on just my friends, my friends, they're still a little bit more in the middle. But um, I just think it's interesting. Um, I haven't re-logged it, though, so don't worry about my star rating. It's changed. Uh, So uh, that's not a spoiler. Um, But I think we have to rate it now, so... My my rating uh, on there as before you've relogged it is the same as yours the first time, which is gotcha. and I'll just uh, no. Let's start with Carly, our guest. Carly, okay. let's hear your rating on. All right, so my rating is four large cantaloupe sized tumors out of five. Nice. nice, and this is just like blanket scores, not not out of. Oh yeah, we're doing this is a redemption score. We're not doing the um, the 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 normal frame rec scale which would be how good it is versus how entertaining it is or how bad it is versus how entertaining it is. this is just like its score uh dylan what you say yours changed what did yours change in? yes um so i i when i first saw this film film was three and a half stars but now it is my name is four out of five occupations <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you, you stole you stole my thing. Um, <laughs> you, didn't steal, you didn't steal it. I was oh, going to do it a little bit different, which is that I was going to say I give it three point five names out of five occupations. Okay, uh, but it's, it's, so it's the same oh, thing. No, you're going uh, to edit right. it out and pick something else. And think of no, something no, else. not at all. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> I'm not four human lead. pretzels out of five. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh th- three and a no, I can't say that. Um, okay, uh, so. Um, yeah, so I, I give it three and a half uh, out of which, which to me it just is a really good movie, and that's what yeah. this is. Oh yeah, we um, all like this movie. And people who see three stars and go, "Oh God, Dylan, you hated it," I'm like, three stars is above average. Like I, I like this a right. lot. Like yeah, no, I yeah, I, I rate stuff higher, so I've had to learn that. Oh, if Dylan writes it three, it doesn't mean he hates it. It just no. If I hate something, thing, I'll give it my, one or two you go to my letterbox. Uh, don't think I hated a movie unless it's below two and a half, and even if it's below two and a half. Look at what I said because I probably said this gets an extra yeah. bump because I like get, it. <laughs> if you get two and a half for me, it's like you're an average film. You're you're perfectly average. If you get a three, you're above average. So like I, I think that's great. Uh, you know, you, you have to earn those four and fives for me. But but again, yeah. my, mine always skew a little fine. higher. So yeah, and that's fine. And that's, that's perfectly totally fine. fine. Every, yeah. Here's the thing: everybody has their own different way that they rate it. Uh, some people rate it on a numerical scale. For me, I have I have uh, a certain like quality standards that they that they meet to get to certain things it's fine and sometimes and sometimes they get a bump all of my bad movies on there get a one star bump if they if i liked them because they were bad so uh yeah, yeah. which this film is not getting because we all redeemed right. it today, we did which is exciting it. yeah anything else on old i mean this has been a good old conversation but no uh, just that i i enjoyed it and i'm glad we got to talk about it yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you watched it. Yeah, watch I'm glad it. you watched it because I, I, yeah. I think we all have those blind spots of M Night where we're like, how? Like I had never seen Signs until a few weeks ago. I was like, how did I never seen Signs? And I still have not seen The Village, so that's my big one now. It's like I got to see The Village. Um, Matt, what's your big Shyamalan blind spot you got to fill? 
Um, I haven't seen his first two movies, uh, which I which are not uh, the things that he made before Six Sense. Six Sense. So it's not like Wide Awake. It, they, they, yeah, Wide Awake and Praying with Anger. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are not those are not considered by anybody anything. Like nobody, most people don't even know that they exist. Uh, so I haven't seen those two, and I haven't seen Avatar or After Earth. So. Uh, so you don't those need are, to see Avatar. The, the last I'm going to just just so, to clarify. Oh, sorry. Did I we've all seen Avatar. the Navi. We've we've been to Pandora, people. <laughs> don't don't go sorry, in the comments right. and be like Matt. Matt's never seen. No, I, we all did it in the, the last the last Avatar. Airbender. I have not no, seen that. I do need to see it because I have a feeling we'll probably cover that at some point on this show oh as well. God. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. I like this. I like the animated series a lot. So oh, uh, I still need to watch the movie mm-hmm. to see because i've i've heard i've heard it's very bad and i'm sure it is mm. uh but i haven't seen it so maybe it's so bad it's good we'll find out someday uh carly any blind spots of m nights you want to you want to fill in to the biggest one is i do want to see signs um and i do want to see the village and the visit um oh, well i haven't seen the village but all three very good movies so yeah, uh, much more on the good than bad scale I'd, I'd say um yeah it's not really a lot divisive but but uh, Village is divisive, and there are plenty of people who tell you that it's not good, but those people are wrong. And I haven't um, seen Lady in the Water, but is that one regarded as bad or good? Or I think yes, it's regarded it's, it's regarded I've very never bad. Seen that one either. I saw it in the theater. I saw it in the theater, and this is this movie. All right, so it comes out after the Village, which which again I liked. Some people didn't. I think it's a very good movie. The Village. Um, it comes. It's it's like the year after Sideways for Paul Giamatti. Uh, it's it's like uh, right after Bryce Dallas Howard comes on the scene, uh, and I don't remember what she was in when. Oh, she was in she was in the village. So like, <laughs> it's got everything. Like it it should be a great movie, uh, it, but he calls it it's Lady in the Water, a bedtime story, uh, which he conceived of while putting his kids to bed, uh, and was telling him this story, which sounds really cool. But bedtime stories generally don't make a lot of sense, and neither does this movie. Uh, but I maybe I need to revisit it. I haven't watched it in like twenty years. We should probably hey, we should probably all watch it. You to know see what how I'm thinking, feel. Matt? It's I don't know what. what your plans are next summer, but we did the summer of Corman. Could next summer be the summer of Shyamalan? You want to maybe take that stab? Maybe do a few. Let's do it. But maybe like Let's Last Airbender. I don't know if you have plans for it. Like if you because you like to plan ahead of time. I, I, I didn't know. I was like maybe it might be fun. And then we could even like if we want to add even a few more than just three episodes. Like maybe do May, June, July, August, September. Um, just like or I don't know. We'll figure. It I out. only I only had one plan, um, for next summer. But we actually decided that we were going to do that episode on um on Marvel's Movie Mondays, which we okay, cool. we'll discuss that then. Yeah, but, and, and we can figure um, that out. Either way, yeah. like I, I think it would be fun to like do at least a summer of Shyamalan. We could double up episodes too. We we have time. Um but like I, I, I think it'd be fun to do like, you know, we could cover Lady in the Water and Last Airbender, the ones that are more divisive. Um and and you know not not necessarily have to cover Unbreakable or, or Sixth Sense or Split, you know, the ones that people love, even though I don't like Split, but you, you gotta know, do I, the happening. I haven't seen the happening and I know yeah, you have to do the happening the big white whale that's the big white whale for us um but but i i've been waiting to do Shyamalan because he is such a polarizing filmmaker but also one that i think caters his filmography a lot to our show so i, I was really excited to talk about this so i'm glad you proposed it carly and i'm i'm glad you were down for it man i'm glad we all liked it i mean i just yeah. think it's so fun to talk about Shyamalan's work in general mm-hmm. um so I'm, I'm very happy this this happened i'm thankful carly will have to figure out which one she wants to be on because we'll have to have her back next summer for yeah i'll, I'll watch, I'll watch it you and i will I'll yeah. watch a few and I'll call dibs on one. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, well, that is it, Matt. Uh, before we do our plugs, do you want to plug next month? Uh, Let's do it. Okay. So next month uh, is Thanksgiving. Uh, well, the Thanksgiving happens next month. Uh, and the movie we're going to be doing is about Thanksgiving. And the movie is called Thanksgiving. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, whoa. it's the e- Eli Roth's movie from last year. Uh, it's... Uh, Full disclosure, Dylan and I haven't seen it. And uh, I've only partaken in the holiday, not the film. Yeah, Dylan and I haven't seen it. We will have our guest on that episode, uh, Stacy. She she loves it because she's from Plymouth, Massachusetts, I think. Is, is, yeah, is around the, there. Yeah. Around Plymouth, Massachusetts. So uh she uh she really wanted to do it, and then she rewatched it and was like, Wait, I don't I actually don't think this is a bad movie. 
we don't care. We're still going to do it. Dylan and I haven't seen it. We'll see what yeah. happens. I mean, this is like another <laughs> uh, like kind of Nightmare 2 thing where we both went in. We're like, oh, we're going to cover this film. And, oh, Matt's mini is back. Um, but, like, uh, you know, we were going to cover Nightmare 2. And then afterwards, we were like, this is actually really good. Um, you know, sometimes we'll go into a film consciously to redeem it like Indiana Jones, like this one, like Bucket of Blood. But some of them, you know, are just like fun, campy B-movies that like we could just talk about. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to do a normal framework episode on Thanksgiving. It might be bad. It might be so bad it's good. It might be so schlocky it's good. It might just be great. And maybe we will make it a redemption, even yeah. though there's none to redeem because people don't like hate it. Uh, but either way, yeah, it's well received. Yeah. We don't care. We're just doing Thanksgiving. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, old is poorly received, so we're we're redeeming yeah. it. But uh, Thanksgiving is going to be fun. That's going to be a fun one. I haven't watched that one yet, but I'm excited to check it out. And Stacy's going to be an awesome guest for it too. Yes, we love having Stacy on. We love having Carly on. And Carly, this is your chance now. Plug what you need to plug. Say what you need to say. Say what you need um, to say. Not much to plug. Just if if you love hot body horror, and you have not seen the substance. You have to see the substance. It's so fucking good oh my god yeah uh, it's just crazy it's sweeping the nation man i love it i love it love it love it um great and you'll see carly soon uh she i, I think this is taking place after nope nope it's coming out Sunday. So you you will see Carly on something very soon, uh, as well as Matt on something very big and very fun and very spooky for a spooky season draft this month, even though I've already said what it is on other outlets. But you'll have to wait and see. Um, but Carly will be on for that. In case this does get delayed till after that, then we can not worry about continuity issues. Um, but uh, Carly will be around for draft day and, and other things very soon. And Matt, what, what do you got going on? Um, I agree you should all go see The Substance. Um, uh, it's one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, I, as far as me, you can find me at Mattman X I I I, uh, just on the internet, wherever I always take that handle whenever something new comes up. So uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's yeah. where you can find me. Uh, yeah. 13 in Nerman numerals. Um, I, I haven't announced it yet, but soon you will be able to find me elsewhere. Uh, stay tuned, uh, to That'll find be out where. His full address on the internet. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, you'll um, you'll be no. able to you'll be able to uh, you'll find out soon. But as for right now, I'm just teasing. Uh, you're gonna find something out soon. Uh, but otherwise, you can find me on Dill Pickle Movie Network on just things. Uh, yep. Last month on uh, Marvel's Movie Monday, we covered uh, Howard the Duck. Go watch it. It was a fun episode. Yeah. Um, otherwise, stay tuned. We'll be talking about Thanksgiving here on Frame Wreck. Nothing planned for Frame Wreck. Until then, um, you know, there's no other movies to, to cover that are that are, you know, big f failures that we need to redeem or talk about or, or assess or anything like that. Um, so you'll have to wait till Thanksgiving to hear Matt and I talk again. And that's all we'll say. And what have a, a great weird thing to say. <laughs> what a weird thing to end on. Anyway, uh, bye, y'all. Thanks, Carly. You were a great guest. We love having you on. And uh, thank you all for watching and, and stay old, but but stay cool. What a story, Mark. Oh,